So we're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Judy, at Judy, Judy is there. Yeah. We need someone out there. And turn the sound up. Bob. All right. Okay. So yeah. looks like we do have a quorum. We have Judy online. Um, so first order of business, we're going to approve the minutes from the May 1st board meeting. Does anybody have any changes, edits, comments? A motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> All right. And moving on to treasurer's report, Clark. I have the, uh, excuse me, Jane. I'm sorry, sorry. Oh. Judy, yes. Hi. It's a little, you're up in the upper my left. I don't know who um, made the motion and who seconded. Each time that happens, if you could just say the names of who made the motion and who seconded for the notes, okay? Uh, so it was Ken made the motion and either, was it Patrick or you guys, Patrick seconded. Got it. Thank you. No problem. All right, Clark. Okay, we have six thousand nine hundred fifty-three dollars and thirty-six cents in our checking account. Thank you. All right, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. We have Emily Walls, uh, president of Observer Media Group. So, and then I believe uh, Peter oh, has okay. a full full in right. introduction. As as uh, was said. Uh, Emily is president of the Observer Media Group. It's a family-owned multimedia company that publishes seven newspapers, six magazines, four websites, mobile apps, and multiple social channels in Florida. Previously, Emily, a fourth-generation newspaper woman, uh, has served as publisher, chief digital officer, and social editor. If there are any really difficult questions asked of her, you may see our guest pirouette out of the room, as interestingly enough, she was a professional ballerina with the Sarasota Ballet from 1995 to 2000. In her spare time, Emily firmly believes in giving back to her profession and community. She serves as a member of the board of directors of the Florida Press Association, Bay Park Conservancy, which we are all very interested in, Sarasota Chamber of Commerce and Neuro Challenge Foundation for Parkinson's Disease. Emily is a member of the Leadership Florida Cornerstone, Class 34, and the International Women's Forum. Emily's awards and achievements are too numerous to list and would take much of her a lot of time if I tried to do so. So it is important, however, to note that she resides in Sarasota with her husband, Pat Robinson, Deputy City Manager of the City of Sarasota, her son, uh, Reese, uh -huh. Barry, and stepson Colin Robinson. I'm pretty sure they don't tell ballerinas before they perform to break a leg. So please pirouette over here, Emily, and <laughs> give your presentation. Thank you very much, Peter. And actually I'll share a little inside ballet tip um, that we don't say break leg, we say mare. So if you speak French, you know what that means. <laughs> and uh, you don't speak French, you want me to tell you? It's a bad word, it's shit. <laughs> oh, mare. It's horseshit. Every day I turn on CNN, I hear that word. Let me see if I can share my screen. Is that working? Great. Um, okay, so um, thank you all for having me. I hope everyone can hear okay. Um, and on the Zoom, maybe Judy, we can see your face. So give me a, a thumbs up if you can hear okay. <laughs> great, awesome, great. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, in our business, we, uh, we say we have a, when we meet with clients or customers, we have an upfront contract. So my upfront contract with you guys today is I'm gonna talk about who we are, the Observer Media Group, how we got where we are today. I'll touch a little bit on the state of the media industry itself, and then where we're going. So the Observer Media Group, we're a family owned and operated pu publishing company. We publish seven newspapers, six quarterly glossy magazines, four websites, multiple social media channels and mobile apps and employ more than hundred people in the state of Florida. We, I'll go a little bit about our history. That handsome guy in the middle is my grandfather, David Blyles, who just celebrated his 94th birthday. He uh, is still the chairman emeritus of our company. He um, resides at Plymouth Harbor. Um, he, he, let's see, he is um, 
second generation in the newspaper industry. My great grandfather, his father was also in the newspaper industry. He was uh, in the circulation uh, department and he actually trained Derek Dunraken, the former Derek, Derek, late Derek Dunraken, who started Sun Media Group down in Venice. Um, so the newspaper industry families, we all connect uh, all over the country. It used to be, there used to be a lot of families in the newspaper industry. So back in the day, uh, this organization called Inland Press Association, which is now America's Newspapers, my grandfather would talk about uh, the family owners meeting, which would have like 200 people there. And now at those meetings, we only have about 30 of us who show up. So that shows, sort of shows you a little bit how of the state of the industry that is turning into a lot of private equity firms um, own most of the newspapers in the United States today. But my grandparents, David and Ruth Bliles, they met um, at a newspaper. My grandmother was the social editor and my grandfather also started out the circulation department. So her favorite joke was that she kept my grandfather out of circulation. <laughs> he, my grandfather worked for Stoffer Communications, which was back then another family owned and operated a uh, newspaper company. And they, he was the publisher, editor and publisher of 12 daily newspapers in the Midwest. My parents um, also, they met in journalism school at the University of Missouri, where we still do a lot of recruiting to this day. So we have a lot of Mizzou uh, journalism grads in our company. Um, my mom passed away last year, but the two of them uh, went all over the Midwest working at different newspapers. Uh, at one of their stops in Brookings, South Dakota, one day a snowmobile had to rescue my dad from the second floor of their townhouse so he could get to the paper to work that day. He was the editor there. And my mom said, that's it. So they moved to Miami and, <laughs> and they thought that they would just try Florida for a little while and see where it took them. And they had plans to move back to the Midwest, but they never did. They stayed here in Florida. Uh, after Miami, my dad became the executive editor of Florida Trends Magazine and then the Southeast Bureau Manager of Forbes Magazine. My sister and I were uh, accepted by the School of American Ballet in New York City because Forbes was telling him he had to come to the home office in New York. So my parents were looking for a place to live and a newspaper broker called my dad and said that there is this little newspaper for sale on this 16 or a 10 mile barrier island um, called Longboat Key and I think you should look at it. So uh, in 1995, uh, is when the Observer Media Group was formed, when my parents acquired the Longwood Observer with my grandparents, David and Ruth Bliles, and a few investors at the time. So then I'm the fourth generation, second generation of the Observer Media Group, but fourth generation in the newspaper industry. This is my son, Reese, and I just added this new picture because that is a very old one. He's uh, <laughs> Much he's taller than me now, taller than his grandfather, and would hate that I had that picture of him when he's little. But that's my favorite picture. I love that picture. So as Peter mentioned, my first career was actually uh, with the Sarasota Ballet. Interesting side story of how I got into the media business. I retired from the Sarasota Ballet in 2000 and then went to Florida State. And uh, after Florida State. I said to my parents, you know what, I'm going to give this dancing one more go and I'm going to move to New York and try Broadway. My mom was very great at making uh, her idea your idea. And she reminded me like, you know, you racked up a lot of credit card debt and in college, living in New York City is really expensive. First and last month's rent, you got to ride the subway. Maybe you should get a job. Oh, there happened to be a reporter position open at the Longwood Observer at the time. So I started working at the Observer and uh, got into the black tie job where I was covering a lot of events and parties, which is really fun to do in your early 20s. Uh, and I remember one of my best friends was up in New York and she's like, I got us an apartment. When are you coming? <laughs> oh, we just had a blizzard. It's so cold. It's so lonely here. And I said, you know what? I'm not coming. <laughs> and I'm glad that um, my path led me here. I love the media industry. I pretty much did um, started out on the editorial side. And then when let's see, it was about the time where I was moving up on the editorial side and the next step was to become a managing editor. 
And I looked around at all the managing editors and their job is to sit in the office and read everyone's stories and edit them all day long. And I don't like sitting in an office all day long. So I was like, you know what? How about I go into sales? So I went into sales and I love that job. I felt like I was a marketing director for a bunch of different businesses and then um, worked my way into helping us launch our, our websites online. I'll get into that a little bit later. So then editorial sales and then digital operations. And then in 2016, I believe I became the publisher of the observers here locally. And in 2021 became the president of our company. So I oversee uh, our Sarasota operations, the Business Observer, and our Orlando market operations. And I'll go into some of that in a little bit too. So like I said, uh, in 1978 is when the Longwood Observer began. And it was started by another family, uh, Ralph and Claire Hunter and their daughter, Janet. And uh, that little newspaper is our flagship publication. And it was the very beginning of our company when we started in 1995. So, um, oh, I didn't know I left this slide in here. I meant to take this out, but this is the original Longboat Observer staff. And uh, the reason why there's a yellow box from this gentleman, that's Bob Lewis. And he retired from our company two years ago and he was 83. Mm -hmm. And so he was with us from the very beginning and, uh, and just retired a couple years ago. Some of you may know his son, Rob Lewis, who works for the county. And Rob looks just like his dad. So our history, we always say that um, if we're not growing, we're dying and we're very opportunistic. So these are some of the, the newspapers or publications that we started. And over here on the gone but not forgotten list are other startups that we had that way we either closed, that didn't work out, or that we have sold. Um, as you'll see, our company has expanded and contracted over the years based on opportunities and, um, and growth in different areas. This is a list of all of our acquisitions, and you can see that some of them have now changed names or merged, um, and then again, some that, that didn't work out. And then two of our acquisitions, the West Orange Times and the Jacksonville Daily Record, both of those are more than 100 years old. Those newspapers are more than 100 years old. Um, our publisher in Jacksonville, I had her look for, I said, what are our archives like out there? And she goes, well, we have some of the original issues from the 1920s, but I'm too scared to touch them. So <laughs> that's, that's something we're working on, our digitization of our archives coming soon. So what we publish today, so we reach nearly 400,000 people in Florida every week with our print and digital publications. Our markets are, as you can see, on the Gulf Coast of Florida with our community weekly newspapers here in Sarasota, Longboat, Sarasota, Siesta Key, and East County, and our local magazines, which is LWR Life Magazine, Key Life Magazine, and Season Magazine. Then the Business Observer reaches from Tampa all the way down to Naples, and their website, businessobserverfl.com. In Orlando, we have the West Orange Times and Observer and the Southwest Orange Observer, along with Season Magazine and their magazine, Local Motion, and their website, orangeobserver.com. And up in Jacksonville, we have the Jacksonville Daily Record with jacksdailyrecord.com, and they, they print some annual magazines as well, like Hospitality Magazine. Are these all free? No, they are not. Great question. And if you have questions, feel free to ask. We have some time at the end too, hopefully too. So our business publications are, they, those are paid publications. And in those paid publications, we print government public and legal notices and we are required by law to have paid circulation. Now the law did change um, in last year where weekly newspapers, free weekly newspapers can publish legal notices. However, uh, you have to be of a certain size and reach enough people or percentage in your location. Now, um, the, our free community papers, we do have an app, which I will show you in a little bit, that you do have to pay for the app, but our, those newspapers are free. I have the app. Oh, good, awesome, <laughs> I am thank there. you, good, thank you so much. So our mission is to inspire our communities with extraordinary local content and to help our partners prosper. And our vision is innovate and elevate. 
So part of our mission is extraordinary content. And I'll talk about this a little bit more too when I go over the state of the media industry. Um, we, all of our content is locally produced by local reporters who live and work in our communities. And each of our, some people are surprised by this too. The Longwood Observer has its own staff of two reporters and an editor. Sarasota has its own staff of reporters and East County Observer. We share content sometimes, but not very often. So every newspaper we have has its own dedicated staff of local reporters. And uh, and it pays off because we win a lot of awards. I think we need we need a new stand to show our to uh, display our awards. I think the Sarasota Observer is up for with the Florida Press Association again this year for general excellence, which is the top award, um, meaning like the best newspaper in the state. So that's pretty exciting. And then our vision, innovate and elevate. So in, I think the dawn of the internet was in 1997. We didn't go online with our publications until 2009. So we were a little late to the game, but I would say that we have doubled down on our vision to innovate and elevate and now have multiple, um, uh-oh, I wonder why I did that digital um, publishing platform. So, and then what you can see here, I just did a screenshot of, this is a live, um, I think at like two o'clock view of our analytics that shows that there were like 244 people um, on the site in the last 30 minutes, 50 users in the last five minutes. And it shows, I'm, I, I don't know why it's, it's doing that on the big screen, on, on my screen too. And then it also show you what stories people are reading right then. And we have this up on a big screen in our newsroom as well. So we can see what people are reading, where they're coming from, if they're coming on, um, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, it's amazing to, to see where people are coming from, if they're coming on their phones, on tablets or laptops. We have all of that information at our fingertips now. Okay. I wonder, because it's fine on here, I wonder if this, oh, that just made it bigger. Here we go. Wait, here we go. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to show a quick video about our app that we launched last year. Observer's e-newspaper edition. You can read it all on your favorite devices, including laptop. Well, well, that's going to be, hold on, hold on. How do I don't know? I am muted. I am muted. I am muted. On my screen. My screen. Okay, let's see. Ah, it's still echoing. echoing. Let's just skip let's the video. Skip the oh, wait, let me try this. Nope, I needed that. Anyway, we'll skip the video. But what I'll tell you about that. So the app is what on your phone or your tablet, and you can access the actual print newspaper, how it is. Um, in print every week. However, uh, the cool thing is, is that you can, when you when you click on an article, oh goodness, that was gonna make me. You can click on the article and you have a special text view without ads. You can share articles, you can translate articles to different languages. There's an audio version, and um, it's a great way to access, you know, the newspaper if you're not at home, if you're up north at your your other home, um, great way to read to read the newspaper. And then um, coming soon, we're here. We go. I can show you. So here's um, here's the special text view where you can read the text view of the of the articles. 
but you just flip through, you can zoom in, zoom out. Um, and again, I, I think you can even, it can read it to you, all sorts of things. There are all sorts of features on here that I don't even know how to use, so it's pretty techy. But what's coming soon is, um, since we have all the editions of the, of the paper, but then we also have our magazines, you can read our magazines on the app as well, and some of our special sections. And then coming soon, we're gonna add a tab on there with, with the latest links from our website, yourobserver.com. So that's one of the ways we are innovating and elevating at the Observer. And then just a quick overview of what's going on with local, with the news industry. So I'm sure you've seen the headlines. We have a joke in the newspaper industry that we're um, our worst marketers because we love to print headlines about how the newspaper industry is dying. Um, <laughs> It is in flux, right? Uh, you can see these graphs that, you know, that this is for US daily newspapers uh, circulation continues to decline. This graph over here shows newspaper employment from 2005 to 2022. I mean, it's gone down. This is an interesting new graph that shows um, the different types of ownership of newspapers. So nonprofit uh, news organizations are popping up all over the place. So that's growing. 50% of ownership of all newspapers is still owned, locally owned, but 25% but is local nonprofits. And then 16% is state nonprofit owned newspapers. And then only 9% of statewide newspapers exist, uh, are locally owned. And then this, I added this headline on here because I read this story today. So there are newspapers, EO Media Group, they're out in Oregon. They are closing, I think, shutting down three of their newspapers. They're reducing uh, daily circulation of their newspapers, uh, meaning so from seven days, they're going down to five. I think the Bradenton Herald, I think, just cut another day as well. So I think they only come out um, two or three times a week now. The Tampa Bay Times only comes out twice in print, and they are mostly an app as well. So this trend is mostly affecting daily newspapers. I think one of the reasons why that's happening is because they use a lot of wire content, right? And so it's not local content. It's so funny. That's what if I, when I read uh, industry articles, they're like, oh, local content, that's the key. And I'm like, duh, we've been doing that forever. Of course it's the key. So, um, you know, if you, when you go and get your daily newspaper, if you have some of those AP stories or wire stories, you've already read about it online. So that's, that's the issue. Our strategy with content is, is that we break news online on yourobserver.com, and then in print is an article that explains, you know, why this matters to you. So it's like more of an in-depth read in the print newspaper. Um, so Emily, when yeah. you say the circulation is shrinking, that's a combination of both physical paper and digital, is that it? No, actually no. So digital, uh, digital, digital readership is on the rise, I believe that um, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, their, their digital paying subscribers are in you know, the millions. And so their, their digital readership is largest. Actually, our digital, um, yourobserver.com is our largest audience. So for instance, we get about nearly 300,000 people visit yourobserver.com each month. So that translates to about 70,000 people every week, right? And um, our largest print newspaper in this area is the Sarasota Observer, and we print about 20,000 of those. If you combine Longboat, Sarasota, CSN, East County together, we print 60,000 newspapers a week. So 70,000 people a week on yourobserver.com, that is our largest audience. So digital continues to grow. Um, when I, I think a stat is also too that I think only 2,000 counties in the United States have newspapers now. So they've, it's really, it's really shrunk. It, it is a, it is a fact, factor. However, um, Florida is different. Now, this is the Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism. They do a local news initiative study every year. And this is the 2003 one. America's Newspapers, which is a trade organization, is not really sure what methodology they use because it says, you know, in Sarasota, it says there's only three newspapers and they're missing two of ours. So, you know, so I'm not really sure. But, you know, this does show you that that Florida does have 
Um, there's only 22 counties in uh, Florida that have only one newspaper and nine without news, a news source. However, Florida is trending much, even though that seems kind of down in the dumps, Florida is actually trending much better. So I'm the recent past chair of the Florida Press Association. Our membership continues to grow, which is amazing. Um, what's interesting is, is that we, well, we just changed our bylaws to allow an online only publications to be full blown members before they didn't used to get a vote, but now they do. And a lot of these online only news websites are starting print publications to go along with it. So that's a really interesting trend and that's different from the rest of the nation. But as you know, our population in Florida is better suited for newspapers. It's a little older, uh, everybody's retired, they have more time to read the newspapers. So, you know, it's, it's a great place to be for the newspaper industry. And then just where, where we're going, um, we have a saying in our company, uh, we go by per Ardra ad Astra, ad Astra by struggle to the stars. And our goal is to be the go-to medium in our niche. Uh, one of my biggest pet peeves is when people say, talk about the newspaper, they only refer to the Sarasota Herald Tribune. Well, come on, we print more newspapers than the Sarasota Herald Tribune does these days. Um, I want people to, when they're talking about the newspaper, they're talking about the observer. And the amazing thing is, is that we're continuing to grow. And I think, It'll be interesting to see what happens out in I-75. Uh, I was recently at a Lakewood Ranch Business Alliance luncheon and Laura Cole, who's the vice president of Sugar Manatee Ranch, said that in their in Lakewood Ranch, they have 70,000 residents now, which is more than the city of Sarasota. Uh, and it's not done. They're not, they're not, they're only at 60% build out. So they have a lot more to go. So I have a feeling what, where we will continue to expand will also be out east. That's sort of uh, the struggle we have right now is because people out in Lakewood Ranch, even if they're not in Lakewood Ranch SMR proper, people who live outside of Lakewood Ranch still consider themselves in Lakewood Ranch. So, but now Lakewood Ranch spans two counties. So how do you cover that? You know, they're in Manatee and in Sarasota. We managed to do it on Longboat, but Longboat has its own town. And SMR, I don't think they have any, the residents out there have any plans of incorporating. They tried it about 10 years ago. But anyway, so do we start another newspaper out there? Do we increase the circulation? I would say the East County Observer is probably the only newspaper in the world that has this problem where we get calls every week of residents out there wanting us to print more newspapers. And uh, the, the struggle with that is, is that if we print more newspapers, then it drives the costs up, right? And then we'd have to raise our advertising revenue. And then we'd price ourselves out, or not revenue, advertising costs. And then we would price ourselves out of the market. So right now we're sort of talking about um, having some locations and maybe some publicists or different locations out there where we charge for them um, to see if, if that will help. Um, anyway, so that's the conundrum. And then the goal is also to get more people using the app. Um, when we started yourobserver.com, it took a lot, it took probably 10 years to really get to where we, you know, where we are today and people changed their habits. So that's something that we're working on. Um, and that is it. Um, thank you so much. I'm so, I don't know why that keeps doing that. And so I, I think we have some time for questions. Oh, absolutely. Time for questions? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Ken. Uh, yeah. Um, how would you describe the observer, particularly the Sarasota observer, uh, describe their editorial policy? The editorial policy. So the Your dad's editorials are fascinating to read. So there's there's two things, okay? So if the editorial policy, if you're talking about the editorial page or Matt's editorials or the opinion page. The page, the editorial. Okay, so the rest of the paper is unbiased, right? We try to sell, tell both sides of every story in the newspaper. The opinion page is Matt's opinion. And that's all it is. And if you don't like it, just skip over it. <laughs> that is what it is. Now I write a I write a column once a month. Um, like yes, it'll come out. It came out today in Longboat. It'll came, comes out tomorrow. Where I kind of focus more 
on local nonprofits and things like tomorrow I'm talking about Suncoast Charities for Children, how they're trying to raise money for the uh, annual fireworks celebration. And, and I think it's important that we do that for our community and that we rally behind them. And it's plus it's a win-win for the community because we keep our annual ce celebration and tradition and children's charities in Sarasota, you know, get help. Like how, how's that a losing situation? So, you know, I tend to, to focus on more local nonprofit issues and things like that, but, but the opinion page is, um, and then I think he has a guest contributor once a week who is also, um, of the, of, uh, to the, yes, thank you. Libertarian, <laughs> yes, uh, in nature. Well, what's fascinating about your dad is that I met him 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and he, he inspires loyalty. Whether you agree with him or not, he inspires loyalty on the staff. And, and the, the, what he would say to you right now, if he was here, is that the point of those of his columns are to spark discussion and to spark thought. Unfortunately, a lot of newspapers across the company have stopped their uh, opinion pages. They've stopped the political endorsements. And, you know, to me, I think that you lose a little bit of what a newspaper is all about, right? And, you know, the other thing about newspapers is, you know, if people don't agree with Matt, we print their letters to the editor. You know, I, I, I even, once I, I, there, I forget, when he tends to talk about national politics is when it gets a little haywire. During the last election, I got a bunch of like, letters addressed to me but like you know the the cut out letters from a magazine <laughs> like they're like threatening letters and i'm like okay well <laughs> i don't know why you want to you know be, don't be mad at me you know <laughs> write a letter to the editor like you know have a little courage put your name on it and we'll print it you know that if you don't like his stuff so so you get to see a lot of all of florida through the eyes of your reporters and the how do you, how would you rate the health of Sarasota based on what you see, the data you see against the rest of the state? Sarasota is unique. Sarasota is amazing. Now, every market is different, right? And we, we were having this discussion yesterday that one of the struggles with growing and expanding to different markets is the, it's really hard to keep your culture. Um, and the observer's culture is we, we work really hard, but we also like to have a lot of fun. So I actually keep encouraging, I found some old issues with the Longwood Observer and I was uh, telling our executive editor, Kat Winkert, I'm like, can we have a little more fun in the paper? We're so serious now, you know? Um, but we like to have fun um, as well. So the cultures in our different markets are very specific to them. Orlando is their, their specific, Jacksonville's different. I always say that, here's a great way to put it. So I was going around the state helping to install this new editorial software system that we were working on. And everywhere, every each editorial team, I said, pick out the restaurant you wanna go eat at. And so in Sarasota, they picked Mediterraneo. In Winter Garden, they picked Panera. And at the time we had newspapers in Palm Coast, we hadn't acquired Jacksonville yet, Palm Coast Florida, which is Daytona market, they picked Cracker Barrel. Barrel. <laughs> so it shows you the cultures. Oh, and actually we had, a, we had a Plant City newspaper at the time too, which is a partnership with the Tampa Bay Times. And they were like, oh my gosh, this is the best pizza you'll ever taste. They picked this pizza place. It was the worst pizza I've ever had in my life. It was so gross. So, but Sarasota is definitely thriving. It's Keeping really your April Fool edition. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any more yeah. board members, Patrick? Uh, yes, Emily. I, I don't know if you spoke with David Lowe about this, but I know we put out a monthly newsletter and we try and put out information about what's happening with the city and oftentimes cite, you know, city articles. But oftentimes there's a nice write up in your observer. And we link to that and Great. try to make sure we identify that. Is that a fair use or have you provided a way that we can check in to have a free uh, non paywall art? Well, on yourobserver.com, it's free and it will always remain free. Okay. Now, the articles on the Business Observer, those are because that's a paid publication now. You, But if you want to use them, you can always just reach out to me and we can, we can make sure that link is, is available or whatever. You talk about the impact of AI. Yes. So 
interestingly enough, I, um, let me back up. We recently set an editorial policy and I'm talking about the news articles, right? Not the opinion page, but I would sure that Matt would do the same for opinion page. That we are not using AI to generate content. We are not using AI to generate images. However, we may use AI to create graphs or, um, you know, or different, uh, we won't use it to replace photography. Let's put it that way. We, we might use it to do that. Now, in the world of digital publishing, when we post articles on our website, we have to write um, like three or four different headlines that are SEO optimized. So they show up better in Google's uh, algorithm. And so we might put our headline, the one that we wrote into AI and say, generate 10 more headlines for me or generate metadata that it's nothing that the public would see, right? It would, and why not have a computer writing for a computer? You know, like it takes a lot of the reporter's times to, time to, jet, to write all the different headlines and the metadata, you know, to get those stories served up in Google's algorithm. So we may use it for that. I tried to use it today to create a graph for you showing the decline in circulation and ad revenue and it gave me back a bunch of code and I tried to try whatever. So, you know, it, it doesn't, it doesn't do everything that you need. So. Research. Research. No, we do not use it for research. No. Yes. How did the clipping services affect you guys? I mean, the reason I say that you seem to be pop up a lot more frequently for local information when you have a, you know, a, a local, some of the you know, clipping services like say, you know, you're in Sarasota. So then obviously a lot of your stuff, pops up in that. How does that You mean you like guys? on Google? Well, on or, Google or, you know, like um, Flipboard or, you know, some of these different... Oh, things. like the the apps, like the Newsbreak app or yeah. things like that? No, that actually um, is great for us because it drives traffic to our website where in turn we serve advertising. So for instance, um, we serve about 10 million ad impressions per month on yourobserver.com. And, and those are all locally sold ads too. So we, we love, you can link to our articles all the time in your e-newsletter, please do. That means we can just serve another ad. Yeah. Well, no, because you guys seem to show up more so than the Sarasota <laughs> Well, and I think- Because I'll, you guys have local content. Correct, yeah. that, is, that is why. And actually Google um, rewards you if you have more local content, like if you're using, so, Sarasota Herald Tribune is owned by Gannett, and that's, so you see their USA Today network stories, right? There's a lot of that in the paper. And if that article, which is probably run on a multiple of their websites, then Google doesn't reward them for that. Like, so if it's one article on one site, you get better rankings. So that's probably why. Anybody else have any questions? I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know what, Jim? <laughs> oh, I'm, uh, just, I was just wondering, in a thriving community, population always growing, have you ever considered two issues? So, uh, yes. Um, I think Matt's dream is to have a Sunday edition. Um, we've talked a few times about in that Sunday edition, Maybe that's where you pull stories from all of the newspapers into one. Um, I don't know. Uh, we've we've gone back and forth about it. One of our markets, when we owned the Palm Coast Observer, they actually went to twice a week. They did, um, I think they did Wednesday and Saturday, and it didn't work out for them. So you know, I, I don't know. It depends. But yes, we. I mean, we've talked about it. Um, no, it's not on the list at the moment. But yes, we have talked about it. And Richard? Speaking of Vienna, is there any major market in Florida they don't own? Gannett? In Florida? Um, Palm Beach Post, South Central, Miami Herald. Right, so the- Tampa Tribune. Tampa Tribune is now Tampa Bay Times. So they're not part of it. No, so the Tampa, Tampa St. Pete is not owned by Gannett. You're correct. Miami is not owned by Gannett. Orlando, Palm Beach is not owned by. I, think, I thought the Palm Beach Post. 
Yes, they are. Sorry, Fort Lauderdale is not owned by Gannett. The Sun does. Correct. And then they control an awful lot of fluoride. I get quite a bit of fluoride. Yes, they have 27 newspapers in Florida, and uh, mostly the dailies. Yes. Yeah. Um, the Sarasota, Sarasota Air Tribune has made an effort to do more investigative reporting. I mean, I'm sure you saw all the uh, stuff from Sarasota County Planning Department. I'm assuming they're going to do Saras the city of Sarasota. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, are you? Working on that angle. I mean, by the way, I like Andrew Warfield a lot. I think his Thank content you. is the best in this Thank city. Uh, but are you going anywhere in that direction that they're that the Herald Tribune is trying to do? No, I mean uh, the Herald Tribune, Gannett, a lot of those big metro newspapers. Their only goal is to get a Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, no, I get. And so that's how you do that. And but the the problem with investigating reporting is it takes a lot of time. It takes a long time to make sure that you are, you know, reporting the truth. You gotta interview a lot of people. You gotta have sources that aren't anonymous. Um, so, and that's expensive to have one reporter working on one story for a long time that doesn't show up in the paper, right? Um, so we've done some bigger packages. Um, we haven't done one in a while. We've done like we did a big special like package on red tide. I think we did one on affordable housing once. Um, but if something warrants it, then absolutely we would put someone on it. But um, no, we don't have any plans uh, to. No. Yeah. yeah. We have time for one more question. I was going to ask the people on Zoom if they have any questions for Emily. No. One more question, if anybody has one more question. I just have a comment. Yeah, okay. yeah. So just taking off my commissioner hat and putting on my citizen hat, mm -hmm. I for one am really thankful that we have the Observer. Thank you. Um, I consider it our local paper. Um, it's unfortunate that the Herald Tribune has diminished their coverage of local mm -hmm. uh, stories. Yeah. And where they have diminished, I think the Observer has stepped up and I feel that we're very lucky whether you agree or you don't agree with the opinion page. I appreciate that it does say my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. crystal clear to everyone. Yeah. My opinion. Yeah. My, you know, it's there. Yeah. And then the rest of the paper, I feel like it is um, it's very much our local paper, from picnics to kids getting, you know, athletic uh, achievement awards to local events to also what's going on in our area. And so I'm. I feel like we're very lucky to have the observer in in Sarasota. Okay. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you so much. Um, and you know your your team is okay. really 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 very professional. So thank, thank you so much. I appreciate so that. Do you have an insight? Do you have an insight on Cox Connor? Uh, I'll second that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Do I have an insight on Cox Porter? <laughs> so the funny thing is, is back in the day when Cox Corner started, the police chief on Longboat Key wrote the Cox Corner column <laughs> himself, um, and they were quite funny when he did it. Yeah. And so, no, we we get the police reports, and then our um, our reporters, you know summarize them. Um, but the interesting thing is uh, actually one of my my late mother's longest wishes was to do a best of cops corner book. And I have a 14-year-old uh, um, indentured servant this summer. <laughs> and he is he's currently going pulling all of the past cop oh, corner great. content. Yeah. And we have another friend who uh, my mom's best friend is helping uh, pull those, and so hopefully you will see a best of Cops Corner book soon. And if you meant Pat, <laughs> no, he doesn't tell me everything that's going on in the police department. All right. Well, thank you very much, thank Emily, you. for coming. Yeah. You're welcome to stay for the rest of the evening. Yeah. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll stay All right. Moving on to well, it's not really new business, but Patrick's going to give us an update on the DSEA oh, website you. and the city website. So, um, 
I'll just give you a quick update. I, we were contacted by uh, the city's information technology department uh, a month or two ago. They were starting a website upgrade process. They're working with Granicus to come up with that. So this is the current city's website and they're going through a major like redo, picking out what's needed in, the, in that. I attended the first meeting on behalf of DSA, uh, this is one of the outside stakeholders interested in that. And they provided a link to three other sites where they're, I guess this particular package of uh, Granicus has been implemented and to start taking a look at it. I've gone through some of these and try and look at how they lay them out. And when you do a search, what comes up with that? Uh, I would like to offer if there's anyone else within our membership here that would like to work with me on doing some evaluations and highly like any feedback. I do know that there is a representative from CCNA also, but since we have a lot of issues with what's going on downtown, we want to make sure that we provide some good input and also the perspective of the kind of things that our downtown population is looking for, which oftentimes is related to construction issues or other land development issues or things that are going on in the city commission planning boards. So there's oftentimes those kind of city activities that are of interest to our members and especially our member reps. So, that's one of the perspectives I'm trying to look at is would their new interface provide us better searches in what ways that we need for that. So I will throw that out there. If anybody is interested, contact me and I'll get you connected into that. Now, in following through on Emily's uh, Innovate and Elevate, uh, this is what DSCA is doing in our innovation. Now, I have a question here. Uh, how many of you were participants remember the first Zoom DSCA board meeting we did? When? Wasn't it, uh, it was, wasn't it like a few months after COVID? No, it was April 1st, 2020. Oh. We had our annual members meeting scheduled at the embassy suite for April 1st. And on March 20th, we were scrambling, what did we do? Well, we learned at Zoom and away we went and we had our annual members meetings on April 1st and we had monthly meetings on Zoom ever since. So that was part of our kind of innovation to help elevate our members to get more involvement. And looking around the room, I would say we got a lot more involvement than we've ever had in our work. So this is an area that we are investigating um, and it's, Emily, you were asked a question about artificial intelligence. Well, in my research on that, most of the public AI apps are based upon a large language model, which has a lot of public data. In my research, I came across a application that's based upon a personal language model. It knows nothing except what you tell it. And I'm right now probably at about the third or fourth grade level trying to teach this thing a few things. <laughs> gets that fifth grade level where it knows a whole lot about Tyrannosaurus Rex. And if you ask a question, they'll give you five pages <laughs> of information. So this is what's involved in training a, a small language model for use where you can determine what the data is for that. And so like right now, I just have a question there. Tell me about this. And so it knows about public information on the website. Uh, the other thing we can do with this particular thing is create personas and so right now we will have a public persona with a published website uh, that and that from this URL public can post questions uh, on that. The other key thing that we're Um, is what we're building now is a member portion available only if you log into the DSEA member website where we might be able to answer questions related to things like well, how many parking spaces way uh, other questions related to land development because it's going to know most about the latest land development applications going in. So this is just an example of something that we're trying to experiment with to determine uh, what types of query services we can best offer to our members. Uh, 
as we go forward. So that's kind of the activity there. And right now we're trying to determine which of these uh, services uh, or searches would be a benefit. Patrick, how do you, how do you, um, are you taking a lot of city data to feed into this? Yeah. Is that how it works? And will it, it's going to be continuous as data keeps coming. Well, that's, this is part of the experiment is what are the data sources and what changes? Things like a land development site plan, once it's approved, that's published, you know, and that's published data and so forth. There may be other changes that come along, things like that. Uh, a lot of it's, you know, tracking some of the things that are interesting. This is part of what we're trying to determine is what are the areas of particular interest that might help somebody do a, a more formative kinds of query to understand things. Uh, so it's right now just spending a few months to try and look at what's involved in that. Uh, the key thing I've learned is that, yes, uh, having the ability to, to manage your data is important, but then having the processes to easily update it. Uh, and one thing we have discovered, that it has integrations to the Google Drive folder, it has integrations to a Gmail account, Instagram, Facebook. So those are where your, your data feeds can come in. You have a data feed from an Instagram account that comes into a different persona, and that persona is trying to react differently, respond differently. So do we have an observer persona coming in? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I can find a 14 year old indentured servant, that might be <laughs> Pretty good on tech. <laughs> yeah, well, he has any uh, kids in the summer, um, send them our way too. Because, I mean, the thing I found out is just learning about this, anyone, this is their career. If you're over, you know, under 50, you're under 60, you gotta, you gotta learn this stuff. And you're gonna have to know it. Um, and it's not a good way to sometimes, but the number of new jobs it's creating to figure out how to train the dragons, training these things is not. Uh, insignificant job, uh, but it, the better trained, the better response. And so that's a refinement process, figuring out how to do that best. It's, it's kind of we're just gonna try anything. Like Is it a simple process to have it, say, read the observer every week or every publication that comes out? Is that a simple process or is it much more complicated to, to tie into your you know, we read an article, we write. Uh, I bet if you put in a link or if you just put in, you know, put in yourobserver.com into it and said, summarize or pull the top stories, it, it could do that for you. Or yes, pull all the stories. Yeah. No, I, I've had it go in there and say, uh, read this web page and give me a one paragraph summary mm -hmm. and cite three things that I might do as a follow up. Read me. You know, limited uses in certain ways can, can be very helpful. That's what we're trying to do. Any other questions? Thanks, Patrick. Um, yeah. um, we don't have there. any old business, and Kathy, you said no, nothing on the city update. You'll have something on no. CCNA yes. later. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so moving on to Ken, Arts and Culture Committee. Yes. It's amazing what's going on in arts groups in the city right now, in the county. And it shows, I think it reflects the high quality of the arts organizations in the county. For example, Choral Artists, led by Joe Holt, uh, is currently uh, participating in the commemoration of the 80th anniversary of D-Day in France. Uh, and they are there right now. And they're performing at uh, the Normandy American Cemetery. There are two million people expected there. They're also going to perform at the Brittany American Cemetery and elsewhere in France, including La Madeleine, which is in central Paris. It's a church in central Paris, very famous, looks like a Greek temple. Um, and it's really a tribute to Joe Holt's revitalization of the chorus. Joe is uh, was a uh, spent 20 years with the U.S. Army Band and the U.S. Army Men's Chorus. He has a PhD in music, and he was director also of the Choral Arts Society in Washington, D.C. So this organization is great. There are 40 people in the group in France right now. And in addition, uh, the Sarasota Ballet is currently in London, and it's their first international appearance. They're at the Royal Ballet Festival. There are two alternating programs of Sir Frederick Ashton uh, choreography. There are six days starting uh, yesterday that they're performing. 
and every performance is sold out and was sold out very quickly. This morning, uh, that other newspaper in town, the Daily One, you know which one I'm talking about, uh, reported that Ian Webb uh, was received the British National Dance Awards for Outstanding Achievement, which is uh, created by the United UK Critics Circle. So uh, there were 311 nominees for that award, and Ian Webb got it. So that's incredible. Uh, the Purple Ribbon Committee met on May 21st. It was a short meeting. The next meeting is August 20th. Um, Jim Shirley suggested to them they may need to increase the frequency of their meetings because they're only going to have a year left to meet, and they've got to come up with some recommendations. And um, not not many decisions, not any decisions have been made at this point. Um, Brian Hirsch reported at the meeting that he's doing a survey of the of, uh, arts organizations in the county to see what their needs would be for the new performing arts center. Uh, and the city commission has agreed to the terms on a design agreement between SPAC and Renzo Piano. And his concept and cost estimates will be due November 30th. Uh, the group did dis discuss convention space used by at the Van Wezel after uh, the new performing arts hall is, uh, is built. But actually, there is a proposal currently being discussed in the city that Mark Kaufman made uh, using the, the main post office. So that's a discussion that's going to take a long time because it's not the first time that issue has been discussed in the city. Um, let's see, the city um, has reported that um, uh, they're, they're moving ahead on artwork for the uh, 14th and 10th Street roundabouts. They have gotten bids for the installation of the 14th Street Roundabout Public Art, and it's within budget, which is a surprise. And uh, if it's approved by the City Commission, guys, um, it could be installed by January. Um, there's another Fringe Festival in town at the Cook Theater at the Oslo, the Squeaking Wheel Fringe Festival running from the 4th of June to the 9th. Um, it's growing very rapidly. It's a small festival, but it's growing very rapidly. So it's very interesting, the kind of differences in, in things of the arts uh, presentation. And the last item is I was elected to the Arts and Cultural Alliance Board of Sarasota County. And uh, I'll start my three-year term later this this uh, Thank you. So we're gonna have your ceremony. <laughs> Is there going to be cake? That's what matters. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Um, Associate and Events Committee, that's me. Um, we're still tricking on the same concept of improving things you can do to improve condo values. Haven't really started the planning process other than I've been looking for alternate locations to host this event. It's pretty difficult to stay in budget for 100 people with 10 to 20 tables around. So um, I did some investigation, and it seems to be that. You can find an event space that's um, fairly reasonable to rent, but then when you bring in the um, wine, you bring in bartenders and their markup costs. So, you know, as you guys know, with this meeting and the events meeting, we don't really do them without the wine social. So, um, probably back to the don't church it is, <laughs> Church of the Redeemer. And um, I've actually held the location for 10 17, that's October 17th, because October 24th, the ideal date that we were trying for, has been booked. So, my update on that. And Green Space Committee is open. Patrick, do you have anything you wanted to add? Okay, great. And then Homeless Committee is Peter. Okay, well, the committee's been active in meeting. Um, at our last meeting, we started gathering frequently asked questions and perceptions by the Condominium Association boards and their residents uh, as to uh, what, what questions they have about the homeless. Uh, as you as you know, as we continue to educate people about people experiencing homelessness, uh, we get we get a group educated, and they start to move on, and we find out that another whole group has moved into town with all the same questions that we were just answering three years ago. So um, we're trying to memorialize some of these some of these questions, and 
we're doing it to develop theme-based information sheets to, to use as a uh, handout for the associations uh, to use, uh, to give to their residents, and we're seeking questions. We have looked at 14 questions this last meeting. They, they were really good questions, uh, but if you have any questions or if your associations have any questions, um, I hate to do this, but you may email me directly uh, and I'll put it out as eagle6541 at horizon.net and I'll, I'll emphasize that on, on a minute. I hope I don't get overwhelmed, but well, maybe I do hope we get overwhelmed. And um, so we will use those and we're looking at the various outlets uh, to publish these questions and answers in. The answers will not be from the committee. Uh, the committee will, will get answers, but we're using the expertise of the people in the community. You may go to a city commissioner and say, hey, uh, this is what's the perception is, what is your perception? How would you answer this question from your knowledge base? I'll go to D, uh, uh, D who's the uh, homeless coordinator for the, for the city or you know, uh, Suncoast Partnership. Uh, and by the way, residents are, or maybe Kathy Sellers, she's yeah. becoming an expert in homelessness. <laughs> so uh, can, that, that's what we're working on now. Can, can we create a homelessness Persona and yeah, I wrote that down next to Patrick's name. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, yeah, I was at a meeting yesterday at St. Pete City Hall, uh -huh. and one of the topics we covered was homelessness, and and uh, one of the issues that came up was homelessness for the LGBT community. Is that a focus in what you're doing? It it, it is only tangentially. Uh, we we have. Uh, we have some representation on the committee with a very active LGBTQ plus person. Uh, but we have, until you just mentioned it now, I don't think we, the, the, that has ever come up. We haven't uh, named it as such. Right. I think it's just been so often. have a pigeonhole that as being the area of concern, but I appreciate what you're saying on that. I think one of the other things too that we're addressing is we have some new things coming out in October that we're going to have a lot of questions about is we don't know what that's going to look like and sound like and I know our community is going to as well uh, some legislation that's going to come yeah, down so we've got a Supreme Court decision it's got to be answered by June 30th with regard to uh, sleeping blocking public park or camping out in public right away and so forth uh, one other thing Kathy you led a little tour group last week about yeah. Resurrection House and uh, you want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, one of my things that I'm trying to do is keep on top of what we have. Sarasota's got a lot. We have a lot that we do here to address homelessness. And I don't think people are aware. We see what we see, and but we don't see the facts part of it. And one of the things that uh, I've come to know over the years is that um, it's about educating people um, to know what we have. I mean, that, that's the reason why I got involved. Anyway, I ended up going to Resurrection House. I went on a tour last year when it was under different, uh, it was a different director. Um, and I walked away and I told David, you know, I went, I walked away with more questions than I had answers <laughs> after that because I'm like, oh, I don't know any of the things that didn't compute with me. So, new director went in there. I felt a little bit better about things and the way the direction that it's going. Um, but I, I want to continue taking those tours, and I, it's not about bringing everybody, it's about bringing some more key people who can help disseminate this information um, and to see what we do um, in Sarasota. So basically that's it, but I do think that we are coming upon something that we're all going to have more questions about, you know, um, by the end of the year. And, and I don't know what that is going to look like and sound like, again, what we see on the streets, there's going to be questions about that. We're trying to get ahead of what, what questions do people have so we can get some answers and we are prepared with some questions and answers. Uh, moving along to health and safety, I assume that's going to be an update on City Watch, either Peter or Kathy. Uh, well, City Watch, City Watch is at a, at a the people who are on the committee and several of you are here. <laughs> I sent out a frustration memo <laughs> uh, this week. Um, I'm leading a bunch of chickens who are going in every direction, but yeah. by, by a single direction. So uh, we will be making some important decisions at the next meeting uh, on City Watch that I'll bring back to the, to the group. 
But if I could just add one other thing yeah. to that, I think that it's kind of morphing into two, the, the two committees are beginning to, to kind of come to merge. Many of the city watch issues on safety and quality of life downtown are coming back and the kinds of emails we're getting are very much oriented to persons who are experiencing homelessness. So we're looking at putting the two committees together. And transportation committee, Roger is not here. Um, is Peter McNamee here? Yes. Patrick. Yeah. Oh, Patrick, I'm sorry. Oh, here. So an update on the May 23rd report from the transportation public meeting. Hi, everyone. Uh, Patrick McNamee on the disco rep from the Boulevard. For only the last couple of months, I'm still trying to sort out who knows what. So this is a little bit redundant, but I'll try to make it quick. Yeah, 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 come see you in the, on the screen, too. The, the, bro the broader context is um, streetscape well, improvements. See on this, we can't see on the screen there. What do you want me? Where's the camera? It was actually more visible. Stand right here. All right. Stand right here. But then they go. Turn the you just turn sideways. Side 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 there you go. Now you got. Now you got it. And not going as expected. You're never coming back. So the city of Sarasota has applied for a federal grant. It's about in the twelve to fifteen million dollar range, and that's for a. Streetscape improvement, 10th and Boulevard of the Arts, from Lemon all the way to the Bay. This is the third year that they've applied for this, but they feel very optimistic that they're going to receive the funding. So much to the point that they put together a plan on what they want to do with those two streets over the next phases of this project if it gets approved. And they had a workshop on May 23rd where they presented in detail a 60% plan on what they want to do with 10th Street all the way and 6th Street all the way. A lot of very good information. The planning folks did a great job explaining it. The Florida Department of Transportation was there. The city engineers were there. The traffic engineers were there. It was very well attended. And they collected a lot of feedback from residents right there on the spot. But they also collected a bunch of written feedback that was the deadline was this past Monday, but it has been submitted. And is being processed by uh, Corinne, who's the planner kind of in charge of this project. Patrick and I are a little bit more focused on one portion of that and that is the intersection at Boulevard of the Arts and US 41. So I just want to report out on, very, on a very small subsection of this broader, complicated plan that's been proposed and is going to have to be ultimately approved and, and executed. But with respect to this intersection, and it's very close to us, the, the residents around us have now gotten together a fair number of times to bring forward the concerns about this intersection. And the first one is the fact that they're considering or proposing eliminating lanes if you're on Boulevard of the Arts, on the bay side, heading east, right now, you have three options when you get US-41. Take a left turn, take a right turn, and go straight. Fine, all working out. But the density so that, in that area is going to- three lanes, three separate lanes. Three separate three lanes, lanes, yeah. The density in this area, as you know, is going to dramatically increase. So there's going to be a big issue for folks trying to get out of that neighborhood. The proposal is to reduce it to two lanes, such that the straight lane and the right lane are the same lane, and you can imagine how much drama that's going to be. The second really important concern is pedestrian safety. I don't know if anybody's crossed that intersection in the past, but you, you better wear a helmet, you better be afraid, you better be <laughs> eyes behind your head. It's a dangerous situation. The time you have to cross, the people are speeding, they're trying to get to a Fruitville roundabout, up to the 10th Street roundabout, everybody's in a hurry on that intersection. So that's the second concern. There's also the coordination of all these eight new high rises, not to mention Bay Park Phase Two, Bay Park Phase Three, in addition to you know a new performing arts center. This whole thing is going to be totally congested, and we don't really believe at this point there's enough planning in place to solve for what's going to happen. The speeds, the speed limits is another concern. The time allowed for pedestrians to cross that intersection. The um, lack of an island so that if you don't get across, you've got nowhere to go but run. It's a very dangerous situation. So. All, all of us who are not traffic engineers came up with a lot of really bright ideas that propose solutions. So. The city has proposed a raised platform, basically a massive, big speed bump. We haven't gotten to the de details of it, but, <laughs> but, it, but it will slow down traffic. When they're not sure if they're going to embed lights in it or put warning signals on it or not, but it's going to be noisier than hell. And I am at the boulevard, and I'm not so concerned about the noise, but all my residents are, all our residents are concerned about the noise. It's plop, plop, plump, plump, and the material that they use, et cetera. It's not really yet well thought out, but that's okay. It's only a 60% plan, so we have time to influence. Um, the city also, they proposed the lane reduction from three to two. We discussed that. 
We think a noise study is going to be critically important. That F dot, here's what's complicated about this intersection. It's city and, and Florida Department of Transportation. It's an intersection that is serviced or controlled by both of these entities. So getting consensus on what to do is going to be a really difficult thing. There's some other ideas where um, what's known as a leading pedestrian interval. That means when you press the button, you've got about three seconds to get ahead of traffic. So at least when you get hit, you'll be in the middle of the intersection <laughs> versus winged. <laughs> Reducing the speed limit, of course, and this is kind of a crazy idea, but again, we're not traffic engineers, is on Tamiami, on US 41, north and south, get rid of the green lights, only yellow. It's always yellow until there's a pedestrian, then it turns red. And it'll, it'll only ever be yellow, but then it'll be green on Boulevard of the Arc. So again, this is enough of, enough of the proposed solutions because we're not gonna solve for this because this is a point of view of residents, not the traffic engineers with, at two different entities, which is gonna be difficult. So where do we stand? The residents provided a bunch of feedback at the meeting, verbal. The residents came back, all of us came back and provided a lot of written comments that we do this past Monday. We've gotten together with representatives from the Renaissance, Alinari, Bociel, Boulevard, Valencia, Ritz, Condor, the Bay, and others, and brought together all this summary of concerns. And now we're trying to communicate it to the city planners, the managers, our commissioners, as well as the Florida Department of Transportation and our mayor. And then the Rosemary District also sent a letter to the city. So we're trying to consolidate everyone's point of view and propose solutions so that we don't move too fast. So the next steps is we're gonna to try to get a joint meeting with the city, with the city planners, with city engineers, maybe even with the commissioners to just raise awareness about this issue. So the focus now is getting everybody continually engaged on this issue and figuring out how we might be able to solve it. Thanks, Matt. Sorry about butchering your name. <laughs> All right, Zoning Code Committee, Peter. Peter? We've got 1260 like, North what? Palm and one park. Okay. Uh, okay, well, in the quay, that's pretty much, um, most of those plans are straightforward. One is uh, meeting with the, the planning department, one part, the other, uh, one part west. Um, is to come to the DRC, and then the rich, Car the second Rich Carlton uh, residences has been fully approved, and they'll be breaking ground soon. One issue is there's no staging room, and I don't know that the DRC is that focused on that. And I spoke with Bob Bell, who runs Coulter Urban, who you know owns all those. Uh, most of the properties in the Quay uh, and the Hyatt. Um, and they said, oh yeah, there's plenty of room in the Rosemary District. So I don't know how that's gonna work out. It's already a mess and it's just gonna get worse. Um, and yeah, so uh, 26 North Palm is now with Lucia Panica, who's gotta make a determination whether the variances that the developer has asked for are she's copacetic with them or whether she will uh, you know deny them based on the retail frontage and habitable space they want some variation and basically it can't get built without these variations because you need space for fire trucks and, and that and the like there was another thing that got filed funny thing um it's a it's under the density uh, bonus attainable housing program, and it's um, Palm near Mound, and this is going to be only a doubling of the density. But it'd be twenty seven units, two attainable, so like seven point four percent of the building would be attainable. Uh, the attainable units will be one third the size of the market rate units. The attainable units are walk ups. It's like a New York City concept. <laughs> Everyone else in the market will, will take elevators up from the uh, <laughs> parking garage. Um, so it seems really inconsistent with the ideas that attainable housing units should be of like character. Uh, you know, there's talk about a corridor. Well, we certainly got that. And uh, they had a uh, preliminary uh, uh, 
pre-filing discussion is is underway with the DRC, but it's it's all public. And I fear that that's kind of what we've kind of that's what we've walked ourselves into with this sustainable housing. And this, yeah, I have strong opinions on it, but I think it was largely written by uh, the lobbyists in town. And you know, this is kind of what we're getting. They're they're going to cherry pick it and. They're going to double density for peanuts of um, attainable housing. I mean, you know, that's kind of, in this case, is 7.4% of the units will be attainable and they'll be tiny and they'll be walk ups. And there's a question as to how do you get in them? Looks like from the preliminary drawing, they go through the patio doors to enter their. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a, that you go off the exterior. Fire escape, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well <laughs> they go in through your patio door. I mean, it's not, you know, in terms of separation from the market rate units, it doesn't get much stronger than that. I think we're going to see more of that. We're going to see market rate condos, and then at the very bottom of the building, there will be some attainable housing. There'll be rentals. There'll be a four door. You know. I think there are several safeguards prevent that from actually happening, but we'll have to stay on. I know, but it was, it was filed by Kimberly Horn. I mean, they're not idiots. So, you know, I think they sort of thought that through and think that there's a fighting chance, right? I don't know. Well, it's directly across the street where I live, so we're keeping an eye on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I think that's kind of it on the yeah. zoning. Well, Thank you, Peter. Do you uh, come any further on the DRC process? Well, I mean, uh, well, so the DRC, I guess they've moved or they're in the process of moving buildings and uh, office space. Well, the office services is yeah, moving space. And all. Yeah, we were going to, we're trying to put together some suggestions on how to make the DRC a little more user friendly to those nerds who actually kind of look at this stuff. Um, and we, put John and some ideas down, but we were concerned that it wasn't going to be higher in their priority until they sort of moved. Um, and I guess another thing, and my condo is a guilty party in this, uh, and this is Patrick's big idea, but there we, we did develop site plans, and in the way one of them is that you have to have significant heights and that the uh, recycling trucks come in and pour the recycling on the back. Um, and that's in all the plants in the, in the quay, and I'm sure it's most new elements, but they're, not everyone uh, is doing that. They're just putting the, both the waste removal and the recycling, the solid waste and recycling bins on the alleyway. In this case, we have space in the Ritz-Carlton, and it's uh, shared with the scenic Merck. So, did I characterize that? Yeah, so we're just investigating to find out where the snafu is, or why, why it's not working according to plan. And so we've been in contact with uh, Public Works and Development Services, and they assured us they got staff looking into this, but one thing that came up is, in terms of when a new development receives a certificate of occupancy, from what I understand, looking at the zone code, the yeah, certificate means that it meets all the site plan requirements. And so is it inspected and tested to be sure that the truck turning radiuses and trash collection are in fact implementable before the certificate is given? Is that part of the inspection or is it just plumbing electrical stuff? So that is a question we think is well, if the certificate means that it is fully functioning to all aspects of the site plan, then it seems to me like the certificate should be the point. And when they do their temporary certificate, now sometimes they got lots of trucks of people moving in, that's understandable, but that's only a temporary for a month or two. And then at some point, there should be a certificate and that should be that trash pickup and everything. And there's not encroachments on the administrative wider rights away and things like that. Was, so, was this one of the problems with the obsidian that I heard about the, the trash? Well, there's potential ones of some new ones coming in. And so what we were trying to look at is of the existing ones, where are we finding? And as we go around, some of the smaller condos are 
having some similar things. I mean, you don't have the big well, used recreational trail outside there. But, but on the Sinians, they're going to move it 200 feet down the roadway to an alley. They're going to move the garbage. Oh, okay. 200, so that's 200 feet down the road. <clears throat> Just so again, that is a concern now as we, as, yeah. as in field development, there's less space, there's less space for staging, and there's certainly less space for just sticking your garbage out there yeah. on that. And so we think as far as since the city has invited us to provide feedback on this the process, we have some other process, but we'll try to work through city staff on finding examples so that they have factual reasons to make the change. So that's where we are, and I think you know, Peter, great job, but I like what you know, Patrick and is has, I, I, reaching out to F, uh, our city staff to re kind of bring them together so that we really do have a good uh, presence working through staff on this. All right, moving to Bay Park Conservancy, Bob Bird. Yeah, well, Ken basically covered a lot of what's going on with the uh, uh, with the performing arts center, so that part's taken care of. Uh, obviously, we had a lot of input last week, last uh, month, and, uh, Mr. Lafley. But um, as far as what seemingly is going on construction-wise right now is really the uh, the seawall uh, on the inlet. That's where most of the work is. That's actually being done right now. Is being done. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how they do build that out. And then, of course, they put kind of put the second phase on hold as far as where the food trucks and everything are going to go because of the uh, uh, because they don't want to overdo do it twice <laughs> essentially. So they're waiting to see what they come up with the design from the, from the performing arts center. So uh, that's it. I mean, and then the other side of it, I guess they're supposed to be starting the resilient shoreline. We'll work on that um, very shortly, from what I understand. But it hasn't actually started. All right, thank you. Uh, CCNA, and um, in interest of time, Kathy, I'll just have you do a, a just a real just a real quick without getting into the weeds. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> there are two takeaways. Get One, closer and out of time. The uh, the special presentation was done uh, was on, on voter registration and the voting process and trying to get everyone to get their residents to get on board with voting to to new mail in voting. And the other thing that I thought was of interest uh, was brought up by one of the associations was. Um, the uh, complexities in getting traffic calling in, and I, that that wow, was an education for me. So I just think it's a little bit more uh, complicated or nuanced, and there's a lot more thought in it than. than uh, oh. <laughs> but anyway, so those were the the things from CCM. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Dave is not here for our from RDA. Um, does anybody have anything that they want to contribute to the Rosemary District Association? Yes. I'm yeah, Melissa. Melissa. <laughs> I'm on Rosemary District with David. Um, I think the one update is that we did provide on the streetscape. We provide in written, um, in writing up by Monday, um, feedback on the plans. So we're very excited about them. Um, the pedestrian is obviously something on our radar screens as well, um, as well as the trees and just making sure that the look and feel is representative of the Rosemary District and the surrounding areas around it. But overall, very excited. Oh, that's great. Thank you and welcome, by the way. <laughs> All right, and time for Platinum Associate News Highlights with Annika. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm Annika Comantius, I'm Associate Liaison to Jamie. Um, I'm going to introduce the sponsors that help make this meeting happen and all our workshops. I think we only have a couple. We'll start with Deanna Sada with Burke Simpson. Hi, Deanna. everyone. I'm Deanna Sada. I'm an attorney, a construction defect attorney with Burke mm -hmm. Simpson. Um, uh, one thing new, I guess, uh, since we're, one, we're, we're being asked to say new things, right? Um, two days ago, uh, DeSantis signed into law a bill uh, that affects uh, property managers in condos and HOAs, uh, but also HOA directors fiduciary duties, which we anticipate will probably uh, transfer to condos. So if you're on the board, uh, I urge you to seek that education. I'm happy to give you a summary of that, if you wish. Uh, the other new thing is, um, you know, Senate bill that was passed not not long ago now actually shortens the time for associations to pursue their rights if there are construction issues, and it makes the time start from instead of the certificate of occupancy, since we were just talking about that, it starts from the temporary certificate of occupancy. So it makes no sense. Uh, and speaking of certificates, the Florida Building Code does specifically say. That the issuance of a certificate of occupancy or a temp certificate of occupancy does not 
guarantee or imply that the building code is being followed because inspectors uh, are not expected to uh, to perform that thorough of, of, of an inspection. I'm happy to speak with you about that uh, separately as well if you'd like. But anyway, so uh, that's that. Yeah. And then our next platinum member is Erin with KW Property Management. Hi, everybody. Good Hi. evening. Uh, I heard a great thing too. Keith out there. Uh, so uh, again, Erin Fabian, KW Property Management. I'm one of the regional vice presidents for the company. We are a Florida based company and we have approximately 300 associations that we manage. Um, and it's about 5,000 employees. So we have some pretty large sessions in the state of Florida. It's and we specialize in the luxury high rise management as well as the, the big um, lifestyle HOAs. Uh, so happy to answer any of your questions about property management. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for platinum and gold. Yeah. And I don't see anybody else online. All right. Thank you, Ami. And then uh, comments from any member reps. Does anybody have any comments? No. All right. Our next DSEA board meeting is Wednesday, July. Oh, Peter, go ahead. No, on, go ahead. Now, on the July 3rd. Okay, yeah, commun... it's July 3rd from right. 4 to 5 30 here. But... I've been communicating with David. He's yeah. a little concerned about July 3rd being a meeting date when. Uh, Next day is July 4th. The only thing going for it is that July 3rd is a Wednesday and July 4th is a Thursday. So uh, unless people are going to take Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off, uh, we're trying to figure board members, what would you rather do? Would you rather move the meeting, cancel the meeting, have the meeting without a speaker? Because I don't think we ought to should bring a speaker. I'm going to be in Rehoboth Beach. <laughs> okay. But, okay. Any, any brother? I'll be here. I'll be here. I would. I'm with you though. I don't think a guest speaker is probably no, a, a good no, idea. No, no. Okay. So we'll we'll go with the July. I'll let David and we'll go with the July. Okay. And a motion to adjourn. It's five twenty six. We've got four minutes to spare. Ooh, this one's going to be so good. Good job. David may not get it. No, I don't. We have a wine social too. If you want to. Thank you for I think doing that. Of course. Oh, I hope I wish because it's unusual. We don't see it. Oh, really? Yeah, I was like, yeah, I just don't want to get it. I was like, I don't want to get it.